So uh, I know I said this a few weeks ago, man, but dude, like I, I could worship with high school students forever, man. Like you guys up here in the front, just watching you guys kind of from the side and um, watching you just kind of be free and let go and sing, like there's nothing, I, I think it's important for your generation, man, there's nothing like worshiping with high school students because, you know, it's like I said Sunday at Southern Hills, dude, you are the church. You are the church today. And uh, it is incredible being able to, to see that and to be a part of that. And I hope that you yourself, especially those of us that, man, this is your first time checking it out. You're not really sure about all this. But I hope that you see the significance of it too. And um, it is for me, it is a joy to be able to stand here and to worship with you and um, just to listen to you sing, man. There's nothing like, like high school students singing. As uh, Sam said, we are in the book of James. And so we're starting this series. I'm going to pray, and then um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into it. I want to tell you real quick, though, if there is a book, you know, if you are a young believer, if, like, you just showed up onto the scene, man, and you're checking Jesus out, James is probably not the best book in the world for you to start in. Because James, guys, listen, listen, James is going to be an incredibly heavy book. I'll tell you, this last year, um, your last year, whatever grade you were in last year, if you were in eighth grade or if you were in sophomore year of high school, your last year, whatever you were last year, our uh, My Life Group guys, Stephen uh, Tucker and Kel, we spent the entire school year in the book of James. Like, we couldn't get out of the book of James. We spent the entire, your last year, 2018-19 school year, the entire year in this book, unpacking this book. And so, in the next two weeks, tonight and next week, we're going to try to, the best that we can, myself and Trey, dude, we're going to break open this book and just kind of give you sort of a taste of what James is doing in this book, and maybe, just maybe, you will go home and you'll be like, maybe I need to read this book. Maybe I need to study this book. Maybe I need to look a little bit more intently into this book. It's an incredible book. The author is who? James. The author is who? James. That's exactly right. The author in this book is James. We believe him to be the brother of Jesus. And if you know anything about James and who James is, he wasn't a big advocate of his brother Jesus. It wasn't until really sort of in the midst of the resurrection, after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, did James really become sort of fanatical about his brother? So much that it would lead to his demise, persecuted because of what he believed about his brother Jesus. And so it's an incredible book, but it's a heavy book. If you've never read it, man, it is an incredible book. But I would say read it being ready because there is a ton that the book of James kind of deals with when it comes to your walk and my walk. I'm going to pray, and then um, we will jump into the book of James. Here we go. God, thank you so much for tonight and bringing us together, God, as a, as a Jesus family. And Lord, I just pray that, um, that tonight, God, you would speak clearly to us. And that, God, you have used this time as we've come together to sing to worship you, God, through song, that you would use that as just a moment for us to sort of come together collectively to receive your word, to hear the truth in your word, and God, to be shaped and molded and moved by it, man. We love you so much. We thank you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here we go. James chapter 1. I'm going to be in chapter 1 and chapter 2 tonight, and then... Um, Trey is going to have the, the sort of the rest of James. And again, we're just sort of cherry picking some stuff in here, hoping that you're going to go back and you're going to study this for yourself. So James chapter 1, and I'm basically going to be reading um, starting in verse 2 real quick. So if you've got your Bibles, you can track with me. If not, that's fine. Just follow along. So I think it's 2 through 8 is what I'm going to be reading starting this out. So here we go. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That makes no sense. That concept right there flies in the face of culture. It flies in the face of your high school. It flies in the face of what you want to believe, right? 
We want to believe that, dude, especially as we receive Christ into our life, we want to believe that everything from that moment on, everything gets better, that life is easy, and that life is smooth, and that Jesus makes our life better in our terms, on our terms. That's what we want to believe about Jesus, that when we receive Christ in our life and we get baptized, man, and we start going to church, we want to believe that Christ makes our life better. And so when we read this statement that James says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, that's like, that is counter to what we want to believe about Jesus. It's counter to what we want to believe because we want an easy life. We don't want any pain in our life. He goes, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. He goes on to say, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He won't rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver. For a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything that they do. That last verse alone, I wish we had an entire month to unpack that verse. And if I could ever sit down and have coffee with you and discuss with you the brevity, the depth of that one verse right there, man. That one verse is loaded, that your divided loyalty, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I want to start out by saying, first of all, when he says that you are, guys, listen, listen, please, that when you are tempted, right, this word testing that he uses right here, this word tempting, the Greek word simply means this, it's pieremus, and it means this, it's a trial and testing, it's not an enticement. We think of tempting as though someone is in, someone, when they tempt me, man, they're enticing me, Right? They're tempting me to eat something. They're tempting me to consume something. They're tempting me to do something. That's not what James is saying here. In fact, he's saying that through this testing, this temptation, it's directed towards an end. So the trial that you are going through is directed towards an end. There is purpose in that pain and in that suffering. Anyone who is tested should emerge stronger, purer from the experience. We've got to expect that we're going to struggle. But when we struggle, the purpose in pain is that we emerge on the other side of that struggle, whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, divorced parents, whether you're struggling with a single parent in the home, whether you're struggling with temptation, like being enticed or struggling with some sort of substance or seeing something on your phone that we don't need to be partaking in, whatever it is, man, that struggle, at the end of that struggle, means to bring you out stronger and purer as you overcome the struggle. That's what James is saying here when he says to consider it pure joy, that when your faith is tested, your work, your, your endurance has a chance to grow. So there are things that we should expect. Sorrow, disappointment, our faith to be tested, things that lure us away from, I'm spitting a lot right here, things that lure us away from what's right, Danger, sacrifices, unpopularity, the word that I've been coming back to a lot this fall, uncommonness. The dude, we are expected as followers of Christ, listen, listen. As followers of Christ, expect struggle. As a follower of Jesus, expect pain. And I'm not talking about a, I'm going to go work out and get stronger kind of pain. I'm talking about emotional, physical, mental pain. Expect it. As a follower of Christ, because when we receive Christ, man, Jesus is not coming in to make our life better. Listen. Please listen. He doesn't come in to make our life better. Jesus comes in to give us the tools to be able to walk through pain and suffering and come out pure and stronger at the end. That's what Christ does. So if you signed up for a Jesus who is going to make your life better, then you probably need to kill that Jesus. Because Christ gives us the tools and the strength 
to be able to walk through pain and suffering and come out of that pain and suffering stronger and purer. It is kind of like a metal, right? Silver. If you've ever seen the process of silver, when they purify silver, man, it's a pretty cool process. They heat the silver up, and what rises to the top of the silver? Impurities. It's called dross. The dross rises to the top of the silver, then they scoop the dross off the the silver, they reheat the process again, dross rises to the top, they scoop the dross off, and and then eventually you have 99.9% pure silver. Guys, this is what pain and suffering is all about, man. When Christ allows us and God allows us to go through pain and suffering, and he will allow you to do it. Jesus wants to bring us through that so that we are stronger and pure at the end of that trial. So there's a means to an end. These things are not meant to make us fall, but they are meant so that we would soar. They're not meant to defeat us, but to be defeated. The test is like becoming a stronger athlete, a greater musician, somebody who has a deeper knowledge in academics. The testing, like I said, is purging of impurity in our life. He goes on to tell us that this testing, that it makes us perfect, not lacking anything. That when you go through testing, when you go through trial and tribulation, man, there's a great thing that comes out of that, and it's called wisdom. You don't gain wisdom because you're smart. You gain wisdom because you've gone through experience. You've gone through life. That's where we gain wisdom. And when you go through this testing, this struggle, you lack or you you are not deficient in life. You gain. And then he says this about wisdom. The wisdom that you ask for, that not when you ask God for wisdom, not to be double-minded. What this means is that it's a person with two minds. That one believes, one mind believes one thing and the other mind doesn't. And all in history, you've studied civil war. And I want you to think about it like this. A double-minded person is a person who is at civil war with themselves. There's internal conflict. And you know that you need to do right, but yet we continue to choose to do wrong. Or we continue to choose to numb it. Or we continue to choose to avoid it. It's a civil war. You become double-minded. And what double-minded leads to is distrust in God. And it leads to chaos. Oftentimes when I, if I'm counseling a family or if I'm looking into the home of a family man and you start to peel back the layers of the family and there's chaos, you can see that there's instability in the home. Oftentimes it's because there's double-mindedness inside of the house. You've got a a mother or a father who are double-minded. Maybe they want to believe Jesus or believe in God, but yet they're living a completely different life. And so double-mindedness creates instability. It creates chaos. Like I said, dude, I could spend a long time on that one text. But what Paul or what James is telling us in here is that your pain creates a greater purity and strength in your life. That God uses your pain so that you can come on the other side of pain stronger and pure. This past two months ago, three months ago, my mom went into the hospital. It's the first time that my mom has ever gone into the hospital, ever. And so this was new for my family. And I realized that, man, a lot of you, you've got family members that you're close to that have been in and out of the hospital. I was close to my granddad. I lost him when I was around 21, but it was expected. But my mom went into the hospital. And I remember going into the hospital, and, and she stayed there for about a month. She was in the hospital for about a month. And I remember watching some of my family members just kind of respond to her being in the hospital. And again, this is the first time And we didn't know what was going on. Doctors were coming in and they were telling her things and it could be this and this and this. And they were doing tests and MRIs and they were putting her through. I mean, I cannot even tell you how many. The doctor's bill was around $200,000 for the four weeks that my mom was in the hospital. She would go home. Things would happen. They would have to rush her back to the hospital. 
And I sat in the hospital room, and I remember thinking this and telling my dad this. I was like, Dad, God has us here for a reason. He's allowing this to happen to mom. And I told dad, I said, dad, we can't waste this moment. We can't waste this pain. And so, dad, what is God trying to teach you right now? And mom, what is he trying to teach you? And I look at my sister and I'm like, Jan, what is he teaching you? And what is he teaching me in this moment? Because we can't waste our pain. And I would say to you, high schooler, If there's one thing out of this piece of this text that I'm asking you to do tonight, for you to think about, is that you would not waste your pain. Because a lot of us in high school, man, we get really good at faking it. And we get really good at figuring out ways to avoid the struggle and the pain that we are walking through in our life right now. We get really good at how to waste it, man. And what happens is, when we waste pain, guess what happens? It comes back around later in life. And it may be in a year, it may be in two years, it may be your senior year that it comes back. And if you don't deal with it then, then it may come back again in your early 20s. And then it comes back again in your 30s. And then it comes back again in your 40s. Because what you quickly learn is how to avoid pain or how to ignore pain. And sitting in the hospital with my mom and my dad and my sister, I'm thinking, okay, God, you've allowed this to happen to my family for a reason. Do not let me waste this moment, God. What are you telling me? And I would say to you, that's pretty dang good advice tonight. Is that wherever you are, and I would say every one of us have some measure of pain in our life right now, whether it's external from outside circumstances, or it's keeping you up at night because it's a mental battle, I'm asking you not to waste your pain. Don't waste it. Because your pain, God allowing you to go through your struggle, is intended to make you stronger. And I hate cliches. I hate them. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So don't waste your pain. Number two, the second thing real quick, is don't waste people. Don't waste people. James goes on to write, he says in chapter two, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith, your glorious Lord Jesus Christ, if you favor some people over others? In chapter, in verse eight, he says, indeed, It is good when you obey the royal law and the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. And then skip on to 12, and he says, So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by this law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. The second thing that James tells us is to quit showing favoritism. The meaning of this that he writes when he says not to show favoritism, he's saying respect people. To respect people. And it means to not to pander to others that maybe have something that you want. And so you pander to them, you lean toward them, or you move toward them because they have something that you want. And so if you show them favoritism, or if you recognize them and you leave other people by the wayside, that's sin. Because you selfishly have something that they have, or you want something that they have. And he says, don't show favoritism. This doesn't mean to favor someone I mean, there's definitely people in my life that if, I've, if I'm going on vacation and I'm choosing five people to go, then there's five people that I'm probably not going to choose everybody in this room, but there's probably five people that I'm going to choose to go on vacation with. That's just, we're all like that. And that's not what, what James is saying here. What he is saying is don't pander to people because they have something that you want. 
or don't pander to them. And he talks about, in this chapter, he talks about rich people and poor people. And it's interesting how Scripture often talks more about poor people than it does about wealthy people. But he talks, he says that for us, that we are not to favor those people who have influence or they have some kind of power or they have notoriety, prestige, they have wealth, they have status. And I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. But James is saying that that's not cool. Oftentimes we say, did you see such and such come to church? We need to go after them because they have something that we need. Or in 912, man, this church, we've got to be a place where those distractions don't exist. That we have to love because we are a Jesus family and we have to love everybody regardless of how they dress or how they look. And oftentimes in your culture, you pander to people because of how they dress or how they look or what college football team they like. But we do this, man. We judge people. Let me tell you something. We judge people based on how they look. And when I was born... I didn't get to say, God, I want to have hair for the rest of my life. Like, that wasn't an option for me. Right? I see some of you shaking your head. Thank you for recognizing that. But that wasn't an option for me. And when you came out of your mom, and that's where everybody came out of, but when you came out of your mom, you didn't get a decision into how you look. And oftentimes... We judge people because of how they look, and we determine what they deserve. Guys, listen to me. We judge people based on how they look, and we determine whether they are worthy of our love based on how they dress, what they say, how they act. And James is saying that is direct sin, and it's against the law of love your neighbor. Because when I study this word neighbor, it means those in the same land. And guess what? We're all in the same land tonight. We all live in the same zip code or surrounding zip codes. We all drove here tonight within the distance of about 5, 10, Bremen 15. Some of you down are Douglasville. But for whatever reason, dude, we're in the same land. And last time I checked in that scripture, it says to love your neighbor, those in the same land, your crew. And not to judge and not to show favoritism. And you know, man, the other day I was pulling out of Mount Zion High School. I spoke at their FCA and it was really early in the morning. And this car was pulling in. And uh, there was a mom inside the car and she was rushing her kid to school. And immediately the thought process that I had was, I knew I could tell that she was not well-to-do. And probably sitting in the passenger side would be a kid who's probably not the most popular kid in the world. This was just sort of me playing this schism out in my mind. And I had this thought, here's a mother who desperately loves her child. Maybe the dad's not in the picture. But she is trying to get her child to school because she wants her child to get a good education. And maybe she has hopes and dreams that her her child will go to college. He may not make the baseball team. He's probably not playing sports. She's just trying to get her boy through school. And she loves her boy. She loves her son. And the last thing that she wants to worry about It's for people gossiping and spreading rumors and hurting and defaming her son. In fact, I've sat across the table in my 20 years of doing student ministry from many parents who say, man, Keith, can you just find a friend for my child? I just wish my my child, my son, my daughter had some friends in high school that she could she could go spend the night with on a Friday night. And that kind of in a moment, it breaks my heart. That may not be the story of that mother, but that's just the thought that I had in my mind. Here's a mother who is desperately trying to get her kid to school, and she wants her kid to graduate high school and go to college. 
and he comes home, and maybe he says, Mom, I don't have any friends, and I can't help the way I dress, and I know we don't have a lot of money to buy a lot of stuff, and God calls us, man, to love our neighbor, and if we operated in that love, then nobody in your high school would be left alone. Think about it. There's 150 high schoolers in this room. Easily, we could say 20 to 30 of you represent most of the high schools in our community. And if we loved, then there would be no kid walking around alone. It was the ordinary people in Scripture who gladly received, and it was the rich people in Scripture who often turned away from Jesus. You don't love your neighbor often, or you wouldn't neglect the poor man. What you love is wealth, and that's not the gospel. If we struggle with that, that's true of all of us. The last thing, real quick, is don't waste your faith. Again, this is a long, this would be an incredible conversation if we just focused on this one text tonight. But don't waste your faith. Chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save someone? Suppose you see a brother or sister that has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Verse 19, you say you have faith, for you believe that there's one God good for you. Even the demons believe this. That's called intellectual faith. We go to high school with a lot of people of intellectual faith. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. And then he says in verse 24, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what by what we do, not by faith alone. Matthew 5, 16 says that words cannot take the place of deeds. Our faith must be demonstrated in school at the lunch table. Our faith must be demonstrated at practice during the game performance. To believe Jesus means to take that belief into every section of life and to live by it. To believe Jesus means to take Jesus into every section of your life and live by it. We have, we have been forgiven of sin and we must show that we are different, that we are uncommon. No one can be saved by works, that's true, listen. But equally, no one can be saved and not produce works. Faith without deeds is dead. And the reality of this is that we go to high school with a lot of people who have an intellectual faith about God. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I go to church. I pray every night. Right? We have a lot of people that believe in God. But when you take out that word, I say it all the time, when you take out that word in and you just say, believe God, it changes the dynamics completely. We have a lot of people that believe in God, but I would probably be safe to say that we go to a high school with a lot of people who don't believe God. Because when you believe God, you have faith with works. And I would go as far as to say what Scripture says, which is truth, and this is probably offensive towards a lot of us in this room, but if you believe Christ, then you're going to produce works. You're going to produce them. Because faith without works is dead. So the question that I would ask you tonight is, is your faith dead? Are you walking out your faith? Is your belief in Jesus, is it actively involved in every single compartment of your life? Is it, 
in your language? Is it in your thoughts? Is it in your actions? Is it how we treat other people? Is it how we love? Is it how we serve? Is it how we give? Because faith without deeds is dead. And so here's a great question. Are you wasting your faith? Are you wasting it? Don't waste your faith, man. So tonight I would encourage you. I would encourage you to ask yourself, am I wasting my pain? Am I wasting people? Am I wasting my faith? Don't. And I would encourage you, man, to jump in the book of James and to say, Lord, I've gotten off track. That's the beautiful thing about grace is that regardless of where we all are in this room tonight, man, Jesus is, he's just waiting right there. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel is that Christ continues to pursue you no matter what you've done. And we know, we know what we're doing if what we're doing is right or wrong, we know it. But Jesus says there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. God, we thank you for the cross of Jesus. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, if you've never received Jesus Christ into your life, dude, tonight's a great night for you to make that confession. For you to say, Keith, I need, I need Christ in my life, man. And for some of us, we've gotten derailed. You have derailed Jesus out of your life. And you need to emphatically or softly say, I need, I need to repent. I need to confess that I've been living for myself, my wants, my desires. I've been pleasing myself. And I need Jesus. I need to clothe myself in Jesus Christ. For some of you, that's a decision, that's a conversation that you need to have. And I would encourage you to seek your life group leader tonight to come and find me. And let's have that conversation. Don't waste your faith. Don't waste people. And don't waste pain. Don't waste it. Become pure and stronger because of it. We're going to sing. And then we got a couple of baptisms from the Bremen zip code tonight that we're going to celebrate and uh, get excited about. God, thank you so much for this moment. Lord, draw us deeper into your kingdom. Draw us deeper into you. Draw us deeper into truth. God, draw us deeper with our community, Father, of like believers, where we stop pretending where we stop intellectually believing in God and we believe you, Jesus. Radically change our heart from the inside out. We love you. We pray this in the name of Christ.